Hello, welcome to Italics, the Italian American magazine. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. First on this edition of Italics, we'll take you to the National Organization of Italian American Women Spring Gala at the Pierre Hotel in New York City. The gala, which took place on April 29th, honored renowned restaurateur, celebrity chef, author, and television personality, Donatella Arpaia. Also during the event, the inaugural Friend of Noi Award was presented to Consul General of Italy, New York, the Honorable Natalia Quintavalle, who also happens to be the first woman Consul General of Italy in New York. Lucia Grillo takes us to the festivities and talks with some of the evening's distinguished guests. Next on Italics, in sequel to our March episode, which focused on Italian-American women ranchers, we'll join Italics correspondent Lucia Grillo and the Calandra Institute's Dr. Joseph Shorre Nevada as they speak with award-winning Italian-American cowboy poet Paul Zarzitsky and with members of generations-old Italian-American ranching families about their ancestors' immigration, or their own, their experiences growing up on the range, a strong sense of community, and the future of cow herding. Now, let's join Italics correspondent Lucia Grillo at the Pierre Hotel. I'm Lucia Grillo with Italics. We're at the Pierre Hotel in New York at the National Organization of Italian American Women's Gala, honoring two fabulous women, Donna Dell'Arpaia, celebrated restaurateur, and the Honorable Natalia Quintavalle, Consul General of Italy in New York. Well into their third decade of activity, Noia has done a wonderful job of elevating uh, the Italian American experience for women. The amount of labor and commitment that the honorees have made really are making our lives a lot brighter and especially for Italian young women. This whole of evening is about the passion of being Italian. How does it feel to step back and watch all the action? It's wonderful. I feel very proud that I has put in my time and I feel very pleased to see how, how well it's going. They deserve really all the support we are able to give them. And I have to say they are the only Italian-American organization who was able to establish a cooperation, a formal cooperation between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It was not easy. It is now my honor uh, to present the inaugural Friend of Neuer Award to a true friend of Neuer, Consul General Natalia Quintavalle. Minister Quintavalle is the first ever woman Consul General of Italy to New York. Natalia is a career diplomat with 25 years of experience. She has worked in senior positions in Geneva, France, Saudi Arabia, Italy, and now here in New York. She has been at the forefront of world health, economic development, and human rights issues. She's of tremendous importance to women all over the world. And for the past 10 years, Minister Quintavalle has been a leader at the United Nations. For Noya, our partnership with the Consul General is a celebration of the traditions of our wonderful shared culture as we applaud the accomplishments of Italian women everywhere. So, uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, ladies. And good evening also to the gentlemen. <laughs> Even if most of my staff are women, and this is certainly one of the reasons and the secrets of our success, uh, I would be remiss not to acknowledge the great contribution of male members of the consulate, so long as they do what we, the women, ask them to do, obviously. And shortly after my arrival, I met Eileen Riotto Sairi who became my guide into the Italian-American world through the vision and experience of an Italian-American woman. She told me, without self-pity, about the double discrimination of being an immigrant and being a woman in a male-oriented and male-dominated world such as Italian-America. But she also told me about the strength skills and determination of Italian-American women to make it possible to have a good life in the United States for them and their families. And from our conversation, 
I learned more than I did from all my readings of book about Italian immigration. The great, courageous Italian parliamentarian, the Honorable uh, Tina Anselmi, once said to your organization, there can be no true democracy without the empowerment of women. And by empowering women, we empower family and society. To achieve the greater good, women need to work not only across the aisle, a phenomenon all too lacking in contemporary political life, but also across the oceans. Well, the only way that we are going to crash through the infamous glass ceiling and to assure that our daughters, our nieces, and our granddaughters, I cannot think to be a grandmother yet, <laughs> do not face uh, the same obstacles uh, as we have, is if we pool our experiences, learn from each other, and work together across the oceans. We are most fortunate indeed to have had such wonderful role models. Let's call them the founding foremothers to show us the way. And Noya, we will continue to be inspired by what you do to promote gender equality, cultural enhancement, and mentoring for the young generation. In accepting this honor, I thus pledge my continued support to Noya, my embrace of our vocation, of your vocation, and my shared belief in the values you promote. As a restaurateur, chef, author, and television personality, Donatella Arpaia promotes the image of Italian-American women. By focusing on Italian food, she has continued to remind people about the importance of Italian culture. At the young age of 24, she opened her first restaurant, Bellini. That was followed by a string of successful and highly acclaimed restaurants. On television, Donatella brings her sophisticated sensibility, style, and glamour. She has written Donatella Cooks and is due to release a second book in the spring of 2014. I was very gung-ho on becoming a very independent, strong woman and went to St. John's Law and became an attorney. <laughs> and six months later, I quit. <laughs> it's been very exciting to translate these Italian traditions in a contemporary American lifestyle. And doing the work of integrating these traditions has become my passion. It's really what life is all about. Whenever I meet successful women, I can always spot the Italian-American woman. She's often extremely warm, very formidable, authentic, direct, intelligent, and talented. From the Pierre Hotel for Italics, I'm Lucia Gulo. The evening also featured a guided wine tasting with a selection of wines from Italian women winemakers and a delightful and insightful presentation by tenor Luciano La Monarca on the significance of wine and food in opera. Next, we'll go to Lucia Grillo and Joseph Shore in Nevada. In its 29th year, the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering in Elko, Nevada, features cowboys from around the world. This year, Italian buckaroos were highlighted, bringing to the fore local Italian-American ranchers who shared their family histories, stories of immigration and community, and recounted growing up on the range and what it's like to be an Italian on the range. I'm Lucia Grillo for Italics. We're in Elko, Nevada at the 29th annual National Cowboy Poetry Gathering. Joined by folklorist Joseph Shore of the Calandra Institute, we'll listen to some cowboy poetry and show you so much more. Antipasto. The town loves antipasto. The linguine way each button mushroom syllable. Fungi, fungi. Gold nubbin plucked from hardwood stump lingers toward the uvula, palate to lips to palate. Say floret, slowly say ivory cauliflower floret. 
miniature sweet pickle, red bell pepper, chickpea, say celery heart, Elba pour filet, pearl onion, and say ebony olive, that favorite we fought over as kids, only the grade A make moms cut to this concertino of sauce, tomato, virgin olive oil, herbs, put up in pints, the red orange pantry rose, say antipasto, pass the antipasto, thrill the inner ear to this bell free of syllables, church bell meals, festive enough for triple table leaves, for old country crystal, chiming Chianti salutes to family, to mom, good health for antipasto. Mangi. <laughs> uh, my mother was conceived in Italy, way up north, Trajovo, little mountain village, I believe on the Austrian border, and um, she came over to uh, uh, America on a steamship St. Paul in utero, and they went directly to Hurley, Wisconsin, because the iron ore mines were in full swing, and uh, the Italians were hard workers and had some experience in the old country. But some of my fondest uh, moments were spent with my noni. I was a little boy. I'd just go right next door, and I'd sit on the wood bar box, and I'd say, noni, Mi voi panna cafe, and she pour me a, a scudella, half full of coffee. Must have been about three cups of coffee in there. And then she take the top off the milk and leave the cream up there and pour that cream in there, put some sugar. She cut off a chunk of Italian bread hard, and I dunk it in that coffee till it got soft. And I ate it, but che bella mi Paolo, because I didn't, she was a peasant, you know, and she, I didn't ask for meat or anything expensive that she couldn't afford. I left the Midwest to study poetry at the University of Montana wasn't within a year I was getting on bucking horses and at the same time I was writing poetry and so they became my two passions kind of hand in hand uh, rodeo and poetry writing and riding well, I came here in 87 I was a little nervous I knew I was going to be bringing a, a very foreign uh, poetic form to the listeners ears but the subject matter was such that you know bucking horses and uh, escorting Grammy to the potluck Rocky Mountain oyster feed at Bowman's Corner. You know, another poem about food, Western food. The audiences kind of were perplexed, but um, they, they couldn't help but, uh, but I think appreciate that Italian charisma in between the lines. Well, my uh, grandfather, Batista, he came over in, what was it? 1879. 1879, he came over because things were getting crowded over in Italy and he wanted a new life. So him and his best friend, they got on a boat and came over to here. And the only work they could find was chopping these pinion and juniper trees around here for charcoal for these mines that was going in Eureka. And they did that for quite a few years. And then he finally said... There are no good women around here. He said, I want a good woman. I want to get married and settle down and start my dream, start a ranch or some property. So Balsamina come to America. They moved on a little old place. And then over the years, just kept getting bigger. And between my brother and I and like my cousin Kevin over there, we probably got right around 500,000 acres, you know, that originally started, you know, through the years. You know, all the same we had family. our dad, Julian, and four other uncles that actually created the Tamara Ranching all over through here, the Bullion Mountains, and they ran cattle. They had buckaroo wagons, it was all in the early 1900s, 19. 1910, 1920. Because <clears throat> when Grandpa Batista came over, he drove a team over in Italy and maybe rode an old horse, but far as breaking horses, working cattle, and he had no idea. Right. And, and everybody helped each other back in them days, yep. and, and they learned, and my dad was a, and Uncle John was quite the bronc rider. They said there wasn't a horse to buck them off. Tell us a little bit about your ranch and, and, and your daughters. Both daughters are married now, and of course their, their husbands, they have other ideas of careers, not ranching, but. I was telling about different. the new generation, your grandsons. The He's grandsons got four grandsons what, coming up for the new generation of ranching. And that's what we're looking forward to, is in my raising it, you know, but 
without having private land, it's going to be tough to run cattle out here anymore with the environmentalists. And so, what do you think is the future of ranching here in northern Nevada? Well, I think it's going to be here. Okay. You know, especially the private landowners like us. And Tommy's like Ranch, my brother, is one of the last family ranches um, in this area where everybody on the family works on the ranch. And then, well, like Susan and Sabrina both, they can weld, they can cut. And both of them can out weld most of the men in this country. Anything we need to do, we make it ourselves without having to go buy it. My dad's dad came to the United States sometime around the turn of the century. We never did know for certain. We think he came in through the port of New Orleans. He came to northeastern Nevada as a mine worker and then went into the ranching business. My father was born in Cherry Creek, Nevada, where his dad had a small mine and they had a ranch. And then my father attended some high school and then it was during the depression and uh, the heck with the school, he had to go to work. And so he was running Mustangs. Now my mother's father came from Pisa, Italy, and he came over, I think, probably with a railroad visa. The, a lot of the Italians came into this area, went to work for the railroad. Their family, they were in several ranching endeavors, and they were milking about 35 head of cows morning and night by hand and selling milk and then raising their crops. One thing I want to emphasize is those Italian people had worth that. They, you know, if, if it could be done by God, they'd do it. Lamoille Valley was kind of prominent in uh, Italian ranchers. They used to have a train would come through Lamoille and bring grapes, and they everybody had to come to town when the grapes came in from California and get the grapes they wanted for their wine. On Sundays, these guys, would, a lot of them would gather, and uh, somebody would bring their wine that day and say, well, we're gonna have my wine with dinner today, and is my wine better than yours, or is yours is better than mine? Yours is too sour, I don't like it. I, <laughs> yeah, but it that was a, an Italian tradition that stayed with us for a long time. And the families had uh, friends in town here too, and when I was a little boy I remember uh, a lot of the Italian families from town would like to come out on weekend to just picnic in our orchard under the apple trees and, and then they, they would do their visiting and, and so forth. My grandfather uh, decided one time they needed to get some chicken feed and, and pullets from Idaho. There was a section gang place there, these little section camps that they had well, most of them were manned all by Italian railroad workers at that time. Well, we got to stop and say hi to these guys, so we'd pull in there and they'd talk. Well, we made three stops before we got to Wells. You know. <laughs> uh, as far as I, our, uh, our meals went and Italian cuisine, uh, I think our, our stuff was basically just plain old ranch food. Uh, but one of the big things they did a lot of cooking with was olive oil. And they had a contact down in Roseville, California, and they'd get this olive oil in case lots, and we used it for just about everything. Right now, we have, on our ranch, we have eight fifth generation people. Two of them, that little guy, two of them over there. I'm a, I'm a third generation, and then Kathy and I have a son Tony and, and a son Mitch, and we're fortunate grandparents. Everybody lives within a half mile of the main headquarters, and so we're all right there, and that's something that a lot of people can't say about their families. My grandfather, Pietro Mori, became Pete Mori. Come from a town in Tuscany called for no Lasco in those mountains. Terrible place to make a living, hard to make a living. You either had sheep or you had goats, you had horses or mules. 
and so you got around, and so you did things. That's the story. Uh, uh, why we want to be ranchers? That's our background. That's all we did in those days. He went to a mining town in Eureka, with, which had 16 ore smelters at the time. He stayed there about 10 years, till 1880. I went back to Italy to check on his family. During that time, uh, my father, Sam, was two sons were born. My father, Sam, was one. When he came back to America, he got a job in Nevada as a track walker. He was lucky. He received a contract from the VNT Railroad to cut wood for him. The more I threw them, moved to Fallon, the Easter farm, and there they raised vegetables. They would load all these vegetables on freight wagons. They got to the mines. God, mines were glad to have all the produce they could get. But they told him, hey, is there any way that you can bring some meat to us? They sure did. And now you know, more I meet and the Hunt Valley meat is still more I meet in Fallon today. Uh, in 1909, my grandfather was able to send for his, some of his family. My father, Sam, was one of them. My father became prosperous. He was one of the best farmers, one of the best land levelers known in Churchill County at the time. By 1920, Sam returned to Italy and he married Yolanda Morini of Forno Velasco, the same town he came from. By 1938, my father had enough, made enough money so he could send for his sons. The first thing he did, he enrolled us in school. He couldn't speak English. My dad, used to feed cattle, he was a cattle feeder. And he's surrounded by cowboys, see? He was the cook, he would cook for them. They liked him a lot and they loved his cooking. So that's, when I, we got there, these cowboys were all around the place. And uh, they were old and worn out. And uh, the only time that, that, that they looked kind of happy, when they came over to visit my dad. He had a place for him, a run porch in the back where he had benches for him. They sit there and they, they would uh, uh, reminisce old time. These, uh, reason I real feel sorry for him now, you know, they were real, real good people. The people that opened the West. These are the ones that I'm talking about. The reason that get this way about them, I get emotional. They go so good to me. They taught me about cows, they taught me about horses. They showed me how to do it. They showed me how to keep from getting killed, which we could have. I've had a lot of great people that had a big influence on my life. Not rich people, but really good people. And by the way, none of them were tired. <laughs> There's a lot of things I've never seen before here or even heard about. Like I've heard more of like my grandparents' stories, but not great and great grandparents and stuff so this today was actually very interesting it uh get a lot of stories i've never heard before it's so interesting and do you think you'll do you think you'll stay on the ranch and be a rancher or i don't know like it's a hard life that since i've had so much of it at a young age that it's kind of it's hard to find interest anymore because like you've done it so much that after a while it becomes tedious and stuff. I, I love it and I'd always come back to it, but I don't know if I, I'll make it a career. What do you think about that? Well, I hope she does because <laughs> she's our granddaughter and I'd like to get her 
with the family back on the ranch. From Elko, Nevada, I'm Lucia Grillo. On Italics News Briefs, we bring you a quick overview of some of the events making news in our community. In commemoration of 2013 as the Year of Italian Culture in the United States, among the numerous events and activities, we would like to highlight In Scena, a presentation by Cairo Italy Theater of Italian Theater, in both English and Italian, throughout the five boroughs. Hi, I'm Laura, and I'd like to invite you to join us this summer for In Scena Italian Theater Festival New York. In Scena is the first Italian theater festival to take place in all five boroughs. Join us from June 10th to the 20th to celebrate Il Teatro Italiano. Well, that's it for this episode. And now, in a belated Mother's Day tribute, we leave you with a poem by Paul Zerzitsky, dedicated to his beloved Italian-American mother. Recipient of the Governor's Arts Award for Literature, poet and bareback bronc writer Paul has been a featured performer at the Elko Cowboy Poetry Gathering for the past 26 years. He has toured Australia and England and has recited extensively, including at the Library of Congress and the Kennedy Center Millennium Stage, as well as with the Reno Philharmonic Orchestra. He was also featured in 1999 on Garrison Keillor's historic radio program, A Prairie Home Companion. Here's award-winning poet Paul Zerzitsky with Buon Compleanno phone call to mom. Happy birthday. Again, thanks for watching. For Italics, I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata. Living mostly in the wistful at times whimsical shadows her memory left behind, my mother two weeks after her stroke, tells me in Italian, tutto passa, everything passes, tutto passa, tells me she no longer has the volontà to cook and to bake her true two loves my entire life. What if it's no good, she frets. At my age, it's a sin my children aren't here to help stuff the bird for Thanksgiving. It's the original sin of your original dressing, I console her. I'll bet it's Catholic, too, because it's too, it, too, is guilty of being the best ever, Mom, since those pesky Protestants docked at Plymouth Rock not one jar of Giardinera on board. Lucky their Indian brethren welcomed them at all after that insipid pickle relish they passed off as feast day fair. Just try to tell me Christ didn't summon up an apostolic pint of antipasto at his potluck. Mom, just pour yourself a chiquette of Christian brothers to soothe your canaruzzi, your vocal cords, your tonsils, or whatever it is you oil up enough to sing along with Frankie Yankovic's You Can Have Her, I Don't Want Her, She's Too Fat For Me polka. If you can remember those goofy lyrics, you can remember to remember to put the damn butterball in the oven this year, Mom. And yes, I swear I I promise I'll go to confession for swearing. <laughs> Trivial as they sound, these are the little gifts I give to my mother for her birthday, a million memories away. Silly laughs, feeble promises, and gift wrapped in the plain white paper of this free verse poem, so alien to her canzonetta ear. A few old country words I conjure up from childhood, mom's heyday. All it takes to keep two Italian hearts marching, marching always toward the appassionata, manja, manja beat of the next big meal. <laughs>